<laughs> Hi everyone, um, we're just about to start, we're just waiting for a few more people to join, but I just thought I'd go through some housekeeping for the webinar. So everyone who's attending is in listen only mode as you just heard, so if you do have any questions throughout, there's a uh, questions bar on the side and you can submit them. I'll um, pose the questions to Anne and Helen throughout and uh, they can give you your answers. Uh, and if there's any issues with like any technical side, then there's also a chat bar as well. So you can just drop us a message if you can't hear or see. Uh, but I'll hand over to Anne when, whenever you're ready to start. Oh, and also, sorry, um, this is being recorded as well. So if you have any, want to see it again after anything, then it will be made available to you. Thank you so much, Lauren. Really appreciate you doing the administration of our webinar for us. So welcome, everybody. This is a jointly hosted webinar between the Stations Company and Pearson, um, and feel very honoured that we are able to do something like this for you. Um, this webinar came about through a conversation that Helen and I had um, during early part, or yeah, early part of this year, I would say, when we were just thinking about the mentoring and the support that we do in education and whether we, we thought people had enough information on some of the key benefits of apprenticeships to young people as they're leaving school and then also some of the changes that are going in education which really does change the landscape. So we thought we'd do this webinar as a, a bit of an update for everybody. It's generally speaking the way that I've designed it is for it to be a resource so you'll be pleased to know I'm not going to go through every single slide in detail. They're there for you to use. As, as Lauren said, it's being recorded, but we also make sure that you get copies of the slides as well. So um, with without any further ado, I'll hand over to Helen um, and then she can do a, a general introduction from the stationer's perspective. Thank you so much, Anne. Good morning, everyone. I'm Helen Esmond, past master of the Stationers' Company and chair of our education committee. Apprenticeships and the livery movement have been bound together since the earliest of times. Livery companies and their members represented a particular trade and used their influence to set standards for their industry. This allowed members of trades from gold to fish to wool to control their trade and in many cases they created a monopoly. These companies and their roles were endorsed by Royal Charter. An ordinance of the Stationers Company in 1554, confirmed by Royal Charter in 1557, established that all printers had to be members of the company. This enabled the Stationers Company to control the printing and publishing industries. It was the start of copyright, as all books published had to be registered at Stationers Hall in a copy register. This gave them a monopoly. Long before printing came to London, early stationers who were manuscript writers and limners were associated with the communication of the word. Today, we have a thousand members who are active or have been in the content and communication industries. This ranges from bookbinding to digital media. These industries contribute more than 100 billion to the UK economy and represent more than 3 million jobs. This means that the Stationers Company is well placed to make apprenticeships one of our central platforms of our charitable educational activities. Pearson PLC is one of our key partners. Our objectives are to ensure a bright future for our industries and to provide new opportunities for young people. This fits with our work to support Stationers Crown Woods Academy in developing appropriate skills for the future employment of their students. These skills include the flexibility and agility to solve problems and to think creatively in an ever-changing workplace. The Stations Company have recently updated our ancient apprenticeship ceremonies in order to recognize contemporary apprentices at Stationers Hall. This provides them with the opportunity to become a member of the Stationers Company and has recently included apprentices from Pearson PLC. We are delighted to recognize Pearson employees at the start of their publishing assistant, digital marketeer, and digital and technology solutions apprenticeships. 
This gives these new apprentices access to a valuable business network. In 2017, the Stationers Company introduced a major new apprenticeship initiative. Recognizing university may not be the path, right path for everyone. We wanted to create a vehicle to highlight apprenticeship opportunities. We knew there were some fantastic career opportunities and apprenticeships within our industries. However, many schools, students and parents were unaware of what was on offer. We wanted to do what we could to change this and to raise awareness of different pathways to employment. Our first major event was Apprentice 18. This was held at Ravensbourne University and there were 30 companies and 300 plus students at a one day event. It was thought to be a great success with excellent feedback from schools and employers. The Deputy Mayor of London for Business remarked at this event, London is the best city in the world in which to do business. And there are so many incredible opportunities for young people to start an apprenticeship that will hopefully set them on the path for a successful and rewarding career. The mayor and I are actively working with employers to increase high quality apprenticeships in the capital as we look to create a workforce that will drive our economy forward in the years to come. Last year's Apprentice 19 was held at the City of London's Guild Hall as a central part of the City of London's Careers Festival. We double the number of potential employers and providers to 60 and well over 2,500 students attended. Some interesting comments from students included, it has opened my eyes to careers I had never considered. Wow, print is amazing. I had not thought about a career in the printing industry. However, seeing the vast range of jobs in this sector from design to engineering, I'm now going to explore career options in print. This year, Apprentice 20 will be, for obvious reasons, in the form of a website. We have widened this event beyond the stationers industries. Companies include Bloomberg, HSBC, Leadership Through Sport, PwC, Pearson, Planet Organic, BBC, White Hat, The Evening Standard, The Telegraph, and all the armed forces. Apprentice 21 will be on the 5th and 6th of July 2021 at Guildhall and will again be a central part of the City of London's Careers Festival. And um, may I now call upon you to please give us um, an overview of the apprenticeships and to take us further through this seminar, webinar, sorry. <laughs> Anne. Thank you very much, Helen. Thank you. And uh, what a lovely introduction to the background of the stationers and how they're linked to apprenticeships. Um, you might wonder why I'm on the call. Um, I have um, a very long standing background in education. I'm a former Ofsted inspector, teacher, um, and an apprentice, actually, many, many moons ago, and have always worked with large employers on their apprenticeship program as a consultant. And I now head up our employee apprenticeship program at Pearson. Um, one of um, the key parts of my role is about that external promotion of apprenticeships to students leaving school, um, to disadvantaged people of varying ages and, and backgrounds, and also to businesses as well. So I'm also an apprentice ambassador for the London region. And Siobhan, my program manager, is an apprentice ambassador for the Hertfordshire region. So one of the um, key elements of this event is, is to ensure that we give you a really good introduction to apprenticeships. I can't cover everything here and now for you, but I think I can give you um, a good understanding of what they're about in this new world of apprenticeships, because there's been major, major changes over the last three years. Um, and as Helen said, schools are still finding it very difficult to actually get the messaging across to both students and most importantly, their parents about what apprenticeships are, where they sit within the educational landscape, the options that are available. And for some, the apprenticeship route is actually much the better route for them, regardless of, of academic ability, actually. 
Then to cap it all, we have the introduction of T-levels from this September, which again are transforming the um, level three, A-level equivalent landscape in, in qualification technical education. So I wanted to give you a bit of an update on that. Um, all, partly because of what students will be looking at as options when they're leaving school, but also the fact that there's a big element there from employers. Uh, I know many of you on this webinar today will be employers, so I just wanted to run through that with you. And then obviously we'll have opportunities for question and answers sessions. We've also got two apprentices um, who are both connected to the stationers, so we're going to ask them to speak as well. So without um, further um, talking. Let's move through into our first um, slides. I'm going to move through these quite quickly because they're there more for a resource than they are for me to talk to. So Lauren very kindly is going to move the slides for me so I will be stopping and just asking her to move on. So the context then behind where we are at this point in time is that um, 2017 uh, May was the introduction of the new apprenticeship levy. Um, and the idea behind that was that employers with a wage bill of three million pounds or more would pay the levy, which is going to be a proportion of their PAYE contributions. This would bring a huge amount of money into the apprenticeship sector that employers would spend on upskilling their staff or bringing in lots of new people as apprentices. Their target back in 2017 was to have 3 million by 2020. As you can imagine, uh, that's not been hit. Um, and the unfortunate picture at the minute is that apprenticeship starts to dramatically down. Um, and as you would expect, to be honest. Um, but the other unfortunate thing that's happened over the last few weeks is that apprenticeship redundancies have grown enormously as well. So it's a tough time for young people leaving the school. But there are a significant number of employers that are actually paying the levy. You move on, Lauren, for me. Thank you. So from a financial perspective, it does put a huge amount of money both into employers' hands to spend, and they must spend it on apprenticeships and not allowed to use it for anything else. Um, and the estimation is there's around 22,000 employers that are actually eligible to pay the levy. At this point in time, significant numbers, particularly in London, actually, are not actually using their levy on apprenticeship training. So from April last year, the government started taking money back. So all of these employers who are not spending their levy, their money is going back into the government as tax. And that is taken out from them every month. Um, we in Pearson, we use our levy. Um, and at the moment, we really don't hope that we're paying anything back to the government at all because we want to utilize it for our people um, we think that's the best thing to do there's also the opportunity now to spend it with other employers which i'll talk a little bit about in more detail later but the idea is that somebody a company that's paying the levy can spend up to 25 percent of their levy on perhaps supply chain companies charities or other organizations that don't have the resource or, or the size to pay the levy themselves to any extent that makes it useful. And we in Pearson are supporting 10 apprentices currently with other organisations, and we have another 30 plus apprentices in the pipeline with other organisations that will be coming on later this year. Lauren. Thank you. Um, these next two slides, I've put them in there just to give you some statistics on benefits, which I thought might be useful to you when you're talking to students or you might be talking to parents, you know, in, in other things that you're involved in. And it's just the fact that there is a huge return on investment for employers to get involved with apprenticeships. You know, you've got the stats there in terms of, of the hard figures, but from my experience, the key things that you get are highly motivated people who are very agile in their thinking, hugely motivated, ambitious to be successful, um, really want to stay in the business and progress in the business. And I, you know, talking, of, thinking about the apprentices that we have, and, and Lauren and Ned are two that are going to join us. You know, they they are very supportive of their peers. They give something back 
because of the investment that's been made in them. And that is certainly something from an employer's perspective is, is to be put forward in our communication with our staff, is it's our investment in you. Because these are not short programmes, they're minimum of a year, and many of them are much longer. So there is very much this investment and talent development that sits behind the whole apprenticeship piece. So Lauren, if you could move on a couple of slides for me. Thank you. So in addition to the levy, there was also something else going on, and that was that the apprenticeship delivery models, the content of apprenticeships were changing as well. And they were originally called frameworks, they're now called standards. Um, and one of the biggest differences was that these new standards have been written by employer groups. They're called trailblazer groups. Um, and they're very much written against specific job roles or clusters of job roles. So they're not set to specific necessarily. Some obviously will be where they're specialists like nuclear scientists, um, but they are very job specific. And whereas before it was ongoing assessment, now you have a much more formal approach to assessment. So within the standards are this formal gateway where decisions are made about whether the apprentice is ready to go into that formal assessment piece. And then the formal assessment is done by an end point assessment organisation. So that's done by an organisation and individuals that the apprentice has never met before. Uh, and the assessment varies across the different standards. So there's a selection of different assessment methods that can be used. But some of the main ones tend to be a project where the apprentice does a presentation as part of endpoint assessment. Um, more often than not, there's some sort of um, knowledge based questions as well. And very often there is either a one to one discussion or in some cases actually a panel interview. So it's, it's not an easy thing, I have to say, to pass. Um, and one of the biggest changes is the fact that um, there's generally going to be a pass merit distinction available. So apprentices are able to decide where they want to pitch themselves. So that's great in terms of personal challenge. Um, some apprenticeship standards contain qualifications, some do not. And there is definitely a move to do away with qualifications. However, a lot of the standards do have some form of membership, either during the apprenticeship or at the end of the apprenticeship, to a professional body. So, for example, if you have somebody doing an HR consultant apprenticeship, which is a level five equivalent, which is higher than um, GCSEs, sort of foundation degree level, um, they can become a member of the CIPD. So I think that that is fantastic. And that was never before uh, available in the original frameworks. All standards must be at least a year and a day in duration. Many are two years, but if you're doing some of the higher level ones, like the degree levels and the master degree levels, then they're going to be longer. Uh, and if they're technical, like engineering, they're going to be longer. Um, and the apprenticeships are available from level two all the way up to level seven now, which is a massive, massive change, isn't it? Which is why, you know, when we're talking to school leavers, the conversation is generally around degree apprenticeships because they might be in sixth form and they're thinking, oh, I've got, you know, I need to do something that's equivalent to university. Actually, try hard not to think that way if at all possible, because actually it's about the job. And if the job is requiring a level three apprenticeship, then it's the level three apprenticeship that's the right thing for that individual to do. They will get the opportunity, perhaps, if it's appropriate, to progress to a degree apprenticeship if it's available, if it fits the job role, if it fits their career choices. So it's an interesting dilemma for us all that yes, these are equivalent to, but we don't look at them quite in the same way. Lauren, if you could go to the next slide for me. Thank you. So just some facts for you. Um, to do an apprenticeship, you have to be 16 or older. There is no age limit. Um, in Pearson, we have two grandmothers um, that are doing apprenticeships and I'm sure that around the country there are people possibly even in their 70s or more that are doing apprenticeship because it's, it's felt to be appropriate which is great. Um, even people with degrees can do an apprenticeship and we actually are finding more and more of that happening where they're looking for a career 
so they apply for an apprenticeship role in, in perhaps HR or project management or data science or something like that, but they're coming in with a degree and providing the degree is in a different sector to the apprenticeship they're undertaking and the job they're doing, then that's perfectly fine. Um, so that's an interesting element for school leavers is the fact that they will be in competition with graduates for apprenticeships. Existing employees can also do apprenticeships. Sometimes we forget that and think they're all about young people coming in. No, they're not. There will be some employees, and, and we have a lot, who actually need the underpinning knowledge and the foundations that an apprenticeship can give them, even though they might be doing the job for a little while. But as long as there's significant new learning, which has to be assessed by the provider that you use, that's perfectly fine. Some employers will actually deliver the apprenticeships themselves um, and some will bring in providers, colleges. We in Pearson work with 16 different colleges, universities, independent training providers to ensure that the delivery for our apprentices is of the highest quality. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we can transfer funds up to 25%, which means actually that we can support um, other businesses in the development of their workforce, which I think is, is very fulfilling. Um, and there's some certainly some initiatives within the London area on reskilling for um, the return to work after COVID-19. Um, so there's a lot of work there with small businesses and also those sectors like construction, hospitality and retail that are particularly struggling. Next slide then, if you wouldn't mind. And the one after actually, Lauren, as well, please. So key things for students then um, is the apprenticeships are advertised on a government website and will always be on the employer's websites as well. If they use training providers, colleges, then they will be found on their websites too. So there's plenty of places for apprentices or candidates for, to go to to make sure that they can um, see apprenticeships. Um, they are only done if the apprentice is employed on a contract of employment. So this is not something that can be done whilst at college, for example. This is a job um, and for at least the duration of the apprenticeship. There is also a commitment from the employer to give 20% off the job training every week. So that's equivalent to a day, which is chunky, I have to say. Um, but it doesn't mean that the apprentice is, is always going out to a training centre or sitting in a class or anything like that. It can be done in different times with the negotiation of the line manager. And of course, depending upon the provider's delivery model will de depend how frequently that is done and the model that is used. I mean, we, we say that's our investment to the individual. Um, so the 20% is something that just has to be thought about and planned for when you're starting an apprentice. There is an apprenticeship minimum wage and also minimum living wage, but I have to advise that most employers pay more than that, particularly the levy paying employers. Um, we certainly do. And it's about making sure you've got the right caliber of candidate applying for the role. So we, we want to make sure that we've got really great people that come through. So we're competitive in our salaries. Um, and of course, it's just making sure that the apprenticeship, when you're putting a vacancy out, the apprenticeship matches the job role. So that there is no issue at all in terms of the fit when, when that employee starts. And we also align the apprenticeship very closely to the performance side of the job. So probation, for example, is a time to test out their work on the apprenticeship, but their work on, on the job. And the apprenticeship should support the development of their skills, knowledge and behaviours in the workplace. It doesn't work in isolation at all. And the training providers are incredibly helpful in supporting line managers and apprentices with um, applying that knowledge. Next slide, please. OK, so apprenticeship vacancies then are open all year round. There will be some big companies, um, some well-known names that recruit in cohorts. And sometimes that's because they're working with colleges and they need the academic year starts. So you might find some start recruiting back in March for a September start. But there are vacancies all year round. You, you just need to look for them. Um, and attached to the slides, I've actually put some websites 
where I think they're really useful to steer students to, where they can find out a bit more information. Um, all employers will have a recruitment process. More often than not for apprenticeship, it, it contains initial assessment around English and maths, and also assessment centres. And of course, at the moment, we've moved into remote. So we're seeing um, where employers are still recruiting for hopefully September, we're seeing remote interviews, remote assessment centres, uh, initial assessment for English and maths is, is generally remote anyway. Um, so it's still happening, but obviously at the moment, not as much as it would do normally. And I just reiterating, you know, I would say to students, apply for jobs that really interest you um, with the apprenticeship attached to it. Don't think that when you leave school, you have got to go for a degree apprenticeship because it's the next level up. It's about actually getting into a job that you enjoy, a job where you think it, it's a career you might wish to follow. Don't worry if it's not, but it's a good place to start. And if you're looking at big corporate organizations like us, then I think it's always great to get a foot in the door, to do something you enjoy, get the apprenticeship whilst you're working there, and then look at your options. Because you're in the company, you have that ability to look around you and see if there's an other opportunity that you think you would enjoy doing or would be great at. The apprenticeship is more than likely going to give you a really good foothold to move into other roles. So next slide for me, Lauren. Here's the um, further websites that I've put into the slides for you. Um, have we got any questions at all at this time? And the no. are, are there any questions, Lauren, that you've got there? Uh, none have come in at, at this moment. Okay, well, that's fine. Right then, well, I would like to just um, ask Ned, who is um, an achieved apprentice with us. He achieved his apprenticeship last year now, isn't it, Ned? Goodness. Um, but he's very much connected to the stationers. So I thought it'd be lovely if Ned was just to speak a little bit about his apprenticeship and his stationers experience. Thanks, Anne. Um, yeah, I, I'd just like to echo everything that Anne has just said about apprenticeships. They, it, it, it's not made quite a big difference to me personally. And it also has made quite a big difference to a lot of people that I've spoken to within Pearson and really help their careers. Um, I fall into that group of people who had a degree and had been working at Pearson for, for a certain period of time. And then I, by, by luck, I went to an event and I met Anne at that event. And I described to her um, the kind of apprenticeship that I was looking for that didn't necessarily fit into the model that as I perceived it as to what was available for people within Pearson and um, it was a very fortunate meeting because Anne took on board the comments that I that I made and she made a big effort to find an apprenticeship which would be suitable for me and we went through this process and and I ended up doing a content producer apprenticeship um, which aligned really nicely with with my role and I chose to do it because I wanted to upskill. I wanted to have the opportunity to demonstrate to the business how dedicated I was to, to, that, to that avenue. Um, and I wanted to, the opportunity to explore new creative possibilities in terms of the content that we, that we produce. So through 2018, I, I, I did my apprenticeship um, and it was everything that I wanted it to be. In, in that respect and um, and then after completing the apprenticeship um, in 2019 um, and made me aware of this opportunity to become bound as an apprentice with the stationers and to be honest I've, I hadn't heard of the stations before but um, I looked into it and I thought it was a fantastic opportunity and um, and so I went through the ceremony and was bound as an apprentice and then I um, then I was I immediately became a, a freeman, which I think is was the first time that that had happened in the in the company's history. Um, but again, it was a fantastic experience, and I've been to lots of events um, through the stationers um, and been to some very interesting talks, um, and obviously also attended Apprentice 18 and Apprentice 19 with Helen, 
um, which were both fantastic events. Um, and then that's just led on to me being um, a big advocate for apprenticeships within within Pearson. Um, and I now manage and mentor an apprentice who is doing the same apprenticeship that I did previously and doing it for many, much the same reasons that I chose to do the apprenticeship. And um, and he has he is really enjoying that experience in the same way that I that I did. Um, and then obviously I've I've decided that um, that I want to 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 help other people within the business. And also um, I'm a, a mentor um, within the Stations Crownwoods Academy. Um, and I also mentor um, another individual within um, Pearson College as well. So um, um, it's been a fantastic experience and I'd just like to really thank Anne for her dedication to, to the programme and everything that she does for the apprentices um, at Pearson. Thank you, Ned. Let me go teary. Oh, um, <laughs> Lovely. Can we hand over to you now? Because you've got a slightly different experience, haven't you? Um, you've come through in a different way. Uh, you came into an apprenticeship vacancy and then got involved with the stationers. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, my path was a little bit different from Ned. Um, I joined Pearson as an apprentice, a level three. Um, I had left school and went into like full time work and um, kind of found that there was no really like progression options for me. It wasn't really what I wanted to be stuck doing. And um, I applied for some apprenticeships and uh, thankfully got, got one with Pearson in um, the BTEC marketing team. And um, yeah, kind of progressed from there. I completed my level three uh, last year in July is when I finished and um, kind of spoke to spoke to Anne about carrying on because I didn't feel like I was done learning and there was so much information that I, I was um, taking on from my everyday role that I just felt um, there was definitely and Anne felt as well really helping me with that and advising me on what to do that there was definitely um, option for more progression um, and because I didn't do my my I didn't go to university um, I f finished on a level so we felt it would be a really good opportunity for me to do a level six uh, having completed my level three um, so I'm now studying at um, LSBU I'm doing a digital marketing course and um, yeah it's been really um, eye-opening I guess because I I didn't want to go to university but I didn't want to be stuck in a role that I couldn't progress in so apprenticeships have kind of opened up every possible avenue for me and it's um yeah really amazing that uh, Pearson did take a chance on me um even without having a degree and um yeah it's kind of start kick-started my career for sure and um yeah again like I I was introduced to the to the stationers and I got um bound and it was incredible very incredible experience it was so um different to anything I'd ever done or had been through and um yeah they've offered me a, like loads of different routes of help and um yeah it's been a really good really amazing experience and I would definitely recommend it to, to anyone for sure Thank you so much. It's lovely to hear from you and lovely to hear from you as well, Ned. Um, I didn't know whether any of the delegates might have some questions for both of you, actually, before we move on to perhaps some. I know we've had some questions sent in, so we'll possibly move to that. But anybody, any questions for, for Ned or Lauren? Yeah, just from, from me, from Helen, just to say that um, it's fantastic to hear from both Ned and Lauren and their uh, experience both with Pearson, um, their pathway that they've taken, and what what they're doing with the stationers too. It's a uh, it's a terrific way of bringing so many strands together. And uh, I know Ned has been a great force in the stationers from the moment he came through the door. <laughs> so we're delighted to have have both Ned and Lauren involved. And, and just to um, back you up on that, I, I know that we've got another group of apprentices um, who, with Lauren, were bound last year that were 
we hopefully moving into three this year um, and some others that have newly started their apprenticeships as well so it's something that is growing after the little seed of that we did with ned back in april last year i think it was so that's wonderful um helen i think we have some questions don't we that were sent in earlier is there anything there that you think is is worth asking and raising yes so um first of all Anne, um thank you so much for that wonderful uh, overview um one question that's come in is why should i consider apprenticeships now both from an employer and apprentice perspective really good question um because you might think that at this point in time with everything that's going on that this would be the last thing to to even think about but one of um, the key drivers for any employer at this time is, is about you know, being ready for the future, being ready for what the new normal is. And apprenticeships are a fantastic way to get yourself up and running and fit and ready, whether it be training up existing staff at the moment, because maybe their time is less utilized, or whether it's even recruiting. I mean, we're working with some small businesses at the moment that are actually recruiting publishing assistant apprentices um, and also um, into retail, which, you know, they're, they're forward thinking. Um, and it is about making sure that as a business, you are ready. As a student, um, I just don't think you should rest on your laurels. You know, you've got this time at this moment to think about what you want to do, to make sure that you've got all your options there and you're taking advantage of them. And where there are apprenticeship vacancies out there, I'd be applying. You know, it's nothing like practice. And also, you know, get yourself geared up for remote interviews, remote assessment centres. That's a skill that will stand you in good stead for the future. I'm absolutely convinced of it because more and more businesses will be doing a lot more remote working. So I think that's quite important. And, you know, there are a lot of students that are a bit rudderless at the moment. They're waiting to hear what their actual GCSE and A-level results are going to be. Um, and for some, they were keen on university. Yeah, I mean, universities are going to be desperately uh, looking for students to come through to them. But don't forget apprenticeships and there will be a big influx of apprenticeship vacancies, I'm sure, come sort of, I think, from July onwards, actually, that those are routes to explore as well. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, another interesting question, as a small employer who does not pay the levy, how can I go about funding an apprenticeship? Yeah, I mean, it's a difficult one for, for small businesses because the way that apprenticeships funded now are different to the way they were before. And a small business might have had a relationship with a training provider and the training provider had the money and then they could fund the apprenticeship. It doesn't work that way now. Um, I think the key thing there is if you're looking for an apprenticeship is to talk to the provider that you used before, if they were good at what they did. What they will then do in turn is link you into the new way of pulling down the money from the government, which is through a, a digital apprenticeship system. Or the other way is to link you up with a big employer like myself. And in London, there is um, an organisation called IPPR that have a contract with the GLA and JP Morgan Charity to do exactly that. They are acting as brokers and support consultants for small businesses who are looking at apprenticeships um, but don't have the money or the resource or the infrastructure really to go about doing it themselves. So, you know, they have the expertise. They are principally focusing on hospitality, catering, uh, catering, retail and construction, but their expertise is there, um, generally speaking, for all. Then, of course, there's also the Education Skills Funding Agency. You can reach out to them and they will have somebody that can speak to you as well. But it isn't so easy for small businesses now. And one of the things we're finding is local authorities are stepping into the breach. So we do a lot of work with Westminster City uh, Local Authority, for example. They have a team that are set up to work with small businesses. There's also the Apprenticeship Ambassador Network, where, again, membership is made up of all different types of employers, but we're there to assist. So, it's about knowing where to go and hence some of the websites I've given you will be useful and some of the things I've said hopefully will be useful too. Great and they uh, and uh, if there's a small employee um, attending this webinar they could actually approach you for some guidance. 
Oh, absolutely, Helen. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, firstly, guidance. And secondly, if they, if they really do want to follow through on a possible apprenticeship, then we could look at transferring some of our levy funds to, to anybody as well. We'll, we'll, I mean, our relationship is one about partnership support. So we're not just going to give you the money, leave you to it. We'll actually guide you and be there should you need us all the way through. And Siobhan has set up a really, really good um, model of support and development with our employers, including um, employer forums as well. So we're going to uh, pilot a remote version of that in the next few months, see how that one goes. Great. Thank you, Anne. Um, there's another question here about the royal of a, um, what is the role of an employer in apprenticeships? Yeah, a very important role, to be honest. I mean, firstly, it's deciding where apprenticeships fit within your business. So, you know, think of a workforce strategy, your development, your succession planning. And are you thinking about upskilling some people as well as employing new, possibly younger people? Think about the roles in the business that you need now and the skill set that you need in the future. So from that perspective, employers really key. But in terms of the practical every day, the line manager is absolutely vital. And Ned, as you hear, heard is a line manager for a current apprentice. Uh, it, well, it's not successful unless the line manager is really involved in the programme, buys into the benefits of it, knows that that individual needs their help and support, and is their guide and their comms with, with the training provider. So line managers, absolutely critical, and we do a lot of work around that. And hence, when we do transfer funds, our support is not just at the high level with the employer, but will actually funnel down to the line manager and to the provider if needed. Great, thank you, thank you very much, Anne. I think you also have a mentoring scheme within Pearson, don't you? We do indeed. We have for our apprentices actually. We've got a couple of programmes. We've got every apprentice has a mentor in addition to their line manager, and then for the apprentices that are on leadership and management programmes or higher level programmes, sort of the degree and the masters, we have a senior leader sponsor programme, and that is um, somebody direct level or above who's just there to sort of talk through um, anything the apprentice is, is thinking about, but in the context of a big corporate company. And we found it hugely invaluable. And we've also started with one of our providers to do a bit of a, um, a cross mentoring with another employer. So our apprentices are talking to some of their apprentices and we're hoping when we get back to whatever new normal looks like, that they'll do some swaps. So they'll spend a day with us and our apprentices will spend a day with them in completely different job roles. We're looking at construction. So um, that's going to be really quite exciting. And I think we'll do that with our transfer of funds as well. Great. I mean, that's very, that's um, very interesting. Are there any other questions that came in, Lauren? Uh, yes, there's two. So, and I think the first one's for you. Um, in the current situation, I've been hearing that some companies have either let go or furloughed apprentices. Is this a reality in our sector and how can apprentices be supported um, to return? Thank you. It is a reality uh, of all sectors, actually. Um, furloughing is the interesting one because um, you can continue with the apprenticeship. So we actually had an apprentice who started her apprenticeship after she was furloughed. Um, and as long as the training provider has contact details, or you're allowing your apprentices to still use their work email addresses, which again, from an HR perspective, is, is slightly different in different companies, then there's nothing to stop the apprenticeships carrying on. And they can achieve a heck of a lot during that furloughing. And it's rather nice in terms of continuity and loyalty for them to feel that support. Redundancy, yeah, I, I think that is absolutely um, something that we're hearing about across all sectors. Um, principally, I suppose, the, the hospitality, the catering, um, it, it's not just apprentices, it's, it's other people as well. Um, where there are redundancies, then the training providers can do a certain amount of work through uh, a scheme that was already in place. So if an apprentice is in their last six months of the apprenticeship, the provider is able to continue to support them, even if they're not employed. Um, so that sometimes will kick in. If that's not the case, then it's a real tough one. It is. 
Um, I'm conscious we need to move into key levels, so I'll hold the questions for the moment, and we will. We've got a bit of time at the end where we can do a few more. So, Lauren, if we can move into T levels for me, and the next one. Right, so T levels is all about transforming the level three education technical qualification set, mostly delivered out of colleges, and the colleges themselves have to have at least a grade two Ofsted inspection, which means they're, they're deemed to be good. Um, there's been a huge amount of work being done over the last three to four years, um, and we're now at the point where the apprentice, the sorry, the T level qualifications have been designed for the first phase that go live in September, um, and they align to the apprenticeships actually. So the content in the T levels will sometimes replicate a content in an apprenticeship, or sometimes there are some sectors where there is no T level designed, and it will be the apprenticeship that is on offer. So they're very much um, work in tandem together. They will be something, or they should be something, that school careers advisors are talking about to students now, because there will be opportunities in some colleges to actually go on to these new T-levels in September. Um, so I'm hoping we're hearing about that this um, in the conversation. I have to admit, possibly not that much, but there's certainly been an awful lot of work done by the Department of Education. I mean, I'm also a T-level ambassador as well so i and i've been talking to a lot of schools um talking to a lot of employers about this too so if we go to the next slide and to be honest the next slide and the one after in fact to be honest can you go to the next one please lauren these the two these two slides say the same thing but just the format's different and i think this is the easiest one to look at um but these are the three pathways that are um that come out in september this year so construction but as you can see there, quite high level design surveying and planning and then you've got digital production design development and education and childcare, and then you've got the others that will be phased out and the details in the previous slide over the next few years now Awarding organisations are chosen from a tendering process to design some of these. So they're spread across a lot of awarding organisations. Um, Pearson actually got one the tender for construction and digital production in the first um, tendering process, but we didn't win any in the second. Um, so they're going to be spread across and quite a number. Uh, at the moment, we don't know what that looks like um, and what the implications of that will be. The government, I suppose, is saying we're going to give you the contract for a year, see how you perform, and if you don't, we'll offer it out again. Um, but certainly, I think numbers are going to be very small to start with, but these eventually will take the place of other level three offerings within particularly further education colleges and possibly even some of the sixth form colleges where they offer uh, BTEC nationals, for example. So there's still consultation about whether BTEC nationals will still be funded by the government so that there's options, but this is, this is sort of the way of thinking of the government is to go the T-level route. So next slide then for me. So the post-16, um, they're made up of quite a number of different elements, so they're very meaty, and I'll show you an example of one in a little while. So you've got the technical education, you've got an industrial placement, they must have achieved their GCSEs in maths and English, up, or a level two functional skills. Um, you can do an A-level alongside it if you wish, but the study time is really intense and there will be industry specific qualifications in some of them as well um, and all of this will be certificated by the institute for apprenticeships and technical education next slide for me um, so the ifate has overall responsibility for ensuring the quality and the quality of content in these particular programs Ofqual will regulate it and just check and make sure it, for, it fits the purpose like they do for GCSEs, A, etc. Um, but employers have a part to play actually in the development of the T levels as well. So there's been employer panels, and some of you might have been approached to be part of that, where you can actually be um, part of the group that develops the content checks that it's fit for purpose that it meets the needs of the different job roles that um you would be aiming to fill from this 
um, and also it's ensuring that it's not overly burdensome. I think colleges particularly are, are really having to think about how they deliver these. The delivery is going to have to be different because of the requirement of the industrial placement. Um, and they're over two years. So it's, you know, they, what they do now, they're going to have to adjust it slightly. Next one for me. And this is a bit about the employer um, contribution into the T-level debate and design. So you've got your sector and your occupational panels. Um, where they will look at the content, the assessment design, um, and the way that the tasks are created. And in some of them, there's a very, very meaty employer task that's required, which will come out of the industrial placement. And I know a little later on, I've got something on industrial placement, but let me just touch on that now for you. Um, it's a minimum of 45 days, which for us employers is positive and negative, really. Uh, we're piloting it with a student in Salford just to see how it goes and what we've done is think well actually it gives us an opportunity to have a young person in the business who's operating at level three so a level equivalent probably about 18 so they're more than likely going to be in their second year of this program um, who's got an interest who's got a real feel that this is the career they want to do and we can offer them say two or three days a week um, over quite a long period of time. That means we've actually got somebody who is really contributing to the business, who could be part of a team, who could be part of a project. Um, and I have to say, you know, even though our pilots got cut short, the, the messaging from it was, was really positive. We actually had one of our former apprentices who's managing that T-level student. And the relationship with the college is, is very strong, because obviously we've never done anything like this before, nor have they. Um, they did all the checks. Uh, we also did a, um, a young person risk assessment, just to be you know, absolutely certain from our perspective. And we put together a bit of a job role, so we knew what they would be working on. And then along with the college, we developed an outline schedule of activity. Uh, and then the college comes in and does some reviews with line manager and the T-level student on a regular basis and as we go through there will be this project which we will be part of and I believe also the line managers will do a bit of a, a testimony at the end so really quite interesting yes there's negatives to it um, the amount of time that you have to commit to this the cost implications of it but from my perspective I see it as a different route way to get young people in the business um, they're coming in at a slightly different level to maybe some that would come in for the apprenticeship. We'll be bringing them in at a higher apprenticeship because they're coming in with the T level at level three. Uh, at the moment, we don't know whether they could go over to a level three apprenticeship, um, but more than likely they would be moving on to a level four if the job role was right. And ultimately, it's about the job role. It's sort of like an extended assessment center. Um, and cost wise, yes, it's the time. But all travel is, is taken care of through the government. Um, they pay the college for the travel of the young person. And um, yeah, we can pay or we can give them something to um, help with lunch and those sort of costs. So it's really interesting and something to explore. And you, you can put a request in for one and I'll, I'll go through that later. So just moving on, if we have a look at one of the um, T-level quals, which is next. So here um, is the construction one. I'm only going to go through this one in a little bit of depth for you, but you can see there guided learning hours of 1800 hours. That is, that's a lot. And it's made up predominantly through the technical qualification. And then you've got the, the various elements of it. So you can see there you have a core that's delivered in year one, and then you've got the employer set task. And don't forget, this is design, surveying and planning. So for this particular T-level, you probably would put your T-level students out for an element of industrial placement in the first year and the second. And then you can see the modules there that they do in the second year. So by the end of it, it's a meaty piece of learning um, that comes in from various viewpoints. You've got the industrial viewpoint, you've got the academic viewpoint, but you've also got the English and the maths and the application of learning into a real situation through the employer set task. 
that's an example. Every single one of them is different. And I've given you an example of um, one of the others as well. Actually, if you go to the next slide, Lauren, we've got the assessment um, that supports this particular one. So it's split up in terms of weighting. Um, and you can see there, there's actually exams as well. So from an educational point of view, both the apprenticeships and the T-levels are going much more back to exam assessment. So objective, externally set methods of knowing that somebody is capable and um, more on the knowledge and the understanding. And then the work placement, the industrial placement is about that application of the knowledge using input from employers. And there's various ways that these industrial placements can happen. There are some sectors where it's particularly difficult to set a placement up and certainly you wouldn't get all 45 days in the one. So there's a lot of um, different things that are being piloted and tried. Different parts of the country, incredibly difficult to get students to travel out because they're in a very rural area. So again, there's talk about how that can be better managed. So there's still a lot of uh, development work that's going to come out, I think, of this first year of going live that will set the tone for the new phases that come through. But I think, you know, just for your interest, I thought that that would be helpful. If we could skip the next two slides, Lauren, because they're very similar, just to give you an example. This is what would be interesting to students is actually where T levels sit in terms of perhaps moving on to university after going to college. So you can see that if they get distinctions, it's going to be equivalent to three A star A levels. Um, <clears throat> so it's very much got that equivalency. It's also recognised with UCAS points for university as well, which is the first time ever that it's come out as clearly as this, I have to say, from qualifications. But that's because it's a programme. It's not a qualification that necessarily sits on its own. It's a programme. OK, moving on. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm uh, conscious of time, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> um, can you move on to the next one for me, please, Lauren? Um, these next two slides are directly from the T-level um, communication campaign around T-levels. So there's some links into the websites. There's comms that are going out to businesses and there's an employer toolkit. And there's also comms that are going out to the schools as well. And in Pearson, we're doing a lot of work with schools to help them be ready for this as well. So um, if you can move to the very last slide, if you wouldn't mind. Um, Lauren, you'll see there, thank you. There's some more websites for you to visit around um, detailed information or just an introduction to um, T-levels from an employer's perspective or a young person's perspective. And that is me. That is a quick whistle-stop tour of T-levels for you. Um, thank, thank you so much, Anne. Lauren, do you, do you think there's time for a question or? Um, yeah, I mean, if people have other meetings, I'm sure they can drop off. There was yeah. um, one well, question came in about T-levels while you were talking, Anne. Could, could you put that question to Anne, please, Lauren? Of course. Um, so the question is, on T-levels, nowadays almost all business is digital. Can you give us a little more detail on the kind of jobs in which people with digital T-levels will be working? Oh, gosh, that's a very good question. Um, I'm probably not the right person to answer that, unfortunately, because I'm not on any of the panels. But um, when you actually look at the detail of the T-levels, they are very specific. So, for example, the um, digital one is very much around, if I remember rightly, uh, design and development. Then there'll be another T-level that comes out um, early part of next year is also digital but that will be focused i think that one's more focused on software um, and development so it's about they, they have sort of headline names for them which is about the, the pathway and then they go down into the specifics um let me just have a quick look yeah um it's digital production design and development and there's digital support services and digital business services um, and I think when you know your college is going to be delivering these T-levels in digital technology, it's a conversation with them about what the content's going to look like. I would expect them to be putting it up on their websites so that you can see how it aligns to your job roles. Um, but I think it, 
not going to be as broad as the apprenticeships. Apprenticeships, are, you know, there's apprenticeship standards in pretty much every single job role in digital technology at this point in time, um, going all the way up to the master's digital technology uh, and AI now as well. But T-levels will, will not have that breadth. They really won't. And interesting, I've been having a conversation with a college about creative and design and trying to find the right course that they do for T-levels that will fit a potential job role that I've got for a T-level student. And it is very much that communication to see where is a good fit. And if it's not, I'll talk to another college. Great. Well, thank you very, very much, Anne. Um, a recording of this webinar will be made available shortly along with a T-level industrial placement fact sheet. Lauren, anything else to add from you? Um, no, I think there's a couple more questions, but Anna, I'll email you those and you can answer them um, maybe after, just email the people that send them in. Will do, thank you. That would be okay. that would be excellent, but certainly we will follow up on those questions. Um, thank you, Lauren, for keeping us on track. Um, to Siobhan Bradley, Employee Programme Manager at Pearson, uh, to Anne Ashworth, thank you so much, Anne really superb presentation and of course to all the delegates to all of you thank you very much and goodbye from pearson's and goodbye from the stationers company thank you goodbye everyone goodbye. thank you